I didn't know I was going to give this talk until Sid <coughs> sent out the agenda for this meeting. <laughs> and my name was on it. I was literally reading it to see what I was going to come <laughs> listen to, and I was going to listen to me. So <laughs> I, I did whip up some things. We did have a brief conversation on the phone about this topic, uh, Sid and I, a while back. And I guess that's why I landed here, you know, this is not going to be like most of the presentations that you will hear. It's not technical. Our jobs are so multifaceted and, you know, uh, so diverse in the different kinds of things that we need to know and do to be effective as NRCS conservation planners on rangeland. Uh, this facet I'm going to talk to you about today is is like the, the sociology part, which I'm not an expert yet. Um, but I know where some resources are, and I have a little bit of appreciation for this angle. Um, so I'm going to try to share with you some things that I've found. Well, this clicker does work. Good. So there's a couple of key publications that I've been promoting and I appreciate and are really the basis for this PowerPoint that I'm about to talk to you about. One of them is The Art of Communication by H.B. Passy. This publication is one of two publications that NRCS publishes that are worth reading. And uh, particularly for, for you as conservation planners, um, here's a quote by Passy. Uh, he says, these notes therefore will be confined to some of the philosophy of working with people and some of the methods and procedures which might be employed to motivate them to carry out sound and practical conservation programs on their lands. No conservationist would be expected to use all these techniques described or to use any of them exactly the way they're stated. It is hoped, however, that some of you might pick up an idea or two which will help you in working with people. And I'll echo that for my presentation today. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff out there, and I hope you know, if you just pick up one idea or two that will help you working with people, then you know, everything that gets presented here is not going to work for everybody. So I hope you get a little bit of something out of it. This is uh, required reading, um, in my opinion. I think I emailed this out to all the participants before we came. Um, the second, oh, that goes backwards. Okay, I got it. Uh, the second publication that I drew uh, most of the material for this PowerPoint from is Working Effectively with Private Landowners, a Guide for Conservationists by Steve Nelly. Does anybody here know Steve Nelly? Okay, I don't. I've never met him. Uh, this landed in my email box about two years ago. Um, I don't know where it's published anywhere. Does anybody know if this is published anywhere? Okay. It's brilliant. It should be. And um, this is my new required reading because it's in some ways an up-to-date version of The Art of Communication by H.B. Passy. Okay, I still think you need them both. But um, Steve Nelly says, uh, those who love the land appreciate the vital role of private landowners and private land stewardship. The ideals presented here represent our best efforts to communicate the principles we have found important in working with landowners. The material, when properly understood and diligently applied, will help you be a more successful conservationist, specialist, advisor, or consultant. And so now this document lives in your email box too. And so pass it on. Um, the last thing, before we really dive into the meat that I have here, in this uh, presentation is, is one uh, angle that I'll emphasize, okay, in uh, working with landowners and having credibility. And, and those are the things that I learned in working effectively with livestock producers training. It's a NEDS course. It was held for years. When I went to it, it, it was a two-week course. Uh, they went for a few years where they didn't hold it, and now it's offered again. The Noble Foundation in Oklahoma is the one that's putting it on. It's a one-week course. I've heard it's excellent. 
if you did not grow up on a ranch and do not know the livestock industry and culture, uh, but you find yourself in this job of having to try to put conservation on the land while you're working with these people, this should be a required course. I did not grow up on a ranch. I picked up a lot of the uh, knowledge about livestock industry and culture that I have when I went to this class. This was a brilliant course for that. Um, people who go to this course love it or hate it. Um, the people I've talked to have either told me, wow, that was a great course. I learned so much that's going to help me to understand better, you know, the, the livestock producers uh, uh, angle and perspective. And then the other half of the people I talked to said, that was the most worthless course I've ever been to. I don't need to know any of that to do my job. I'm a conservationist. I'm not a veterinarian. I'm not a livestock producer. I don't need to know all that crap. And I didn't appreciate being inundated in it for a week. Okay. So um, I guess if you find yourself in the second camp, working directly with private landowners might not be your forte. OK? <laughs> but this, this course will help you to uh, improve that aspect of your job a lot. Uh, so I'm saying to you that uh, take this course. A conservationist does not need to be an expert on the livestock industry. You don't need to be an expert, okay? But if you're working with ranchers, you better be able to have a conversation about it. Um, you know how we rate ourselves on our skills and abilities? One through five. Number one means awareness. Number five means you can teach it. So a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today that have to do with uh, livestock industry to do our job in doing conservation planning, you should at least have an awareness level of those things. You need to be the expert on all the technical things that we talk about all the time, about SWAPA resources, about plants and plant ID and soil and the, the conservation technical things. You do need to shoot for that five score. But at the same time, you better be at least a one on your animal husbandry. Okay. So if you ask a rancher to tell you about their operation, you should be able to understand what they tell you when they answer. Okay, so incorporated into this PowerPoint today, um, on every slide we'll talk about a little snippet that H.B. Uh, Passy or Steve Nelly wrote, but there's going to be a quiz, and it's about livestock business and culture on each slide of this presentation. So you can kind of test yourself. And uh, I don't know, keep score if you want or don't. But uh, see how much you know about livestock industry and culture as we go along. Patty. I do not know. It was all about beef when I took it. It's true. Okay. Building a relationship. Uh, before any meaningful long-term conservation assistance can happen, a relationship of trust has to be established. Okay. We can do, uh, what did Tom Hett say this morning, the, the retail conservation, the fast food conservation. That happens. but. That's just the foot in the door. If we want it to be uh, meaningful long-term assistance, a relationship of trust has to be established. Trust and confidence are the cornerstone of landowner assistance. I'm going to have to be careful where I click here to reveal the quiz questions too early. But just about how much does that bale of hay weigh? <laughs> Twelve hundred pounds. Any other guesses? One ton. Who said that? It's okay. They're supposed to be about a thousand pounds 
but they do vary. 800 to 1,200 or even more. They can vary a lot. But they're supposed to be about 1,000 pounds. Okay. Earning their trust. If you work for a government agency, you have to understand many loan owners have a built-in distrust or skepticism about you and the government and the employees. That's you. And you're going to have to work hard to overcome that. That's your first obstacle. Um, you're going to have to prove to them that you're there to help them and not just carry out the mandates of your agency. That you are genuine and you want to help. And Steve says a quote here that uh, if it don't take much time, it's not worth much. This is going to take time on some occasions to make this happen. It's an investment on our part. Um, you know, I wish I had more stories. Maybe I should have just told you stories from work in this presentation. But if, if any of you have any stories or examples, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm going to have to cut this short anyway, so uh, don't be afraid to share. What did you say, Patty? Roy? <laughs> Maybe tonight after the, the thing. I'll tell you about Roy. All right. What is meant by pulled? Like somebody cut them off? Oh, they're born without horns. That's a pulled livestock. In case you didn't know. Understand your responsibility and privilege. Apart from the economic and ecological value, that land has a great deal of personal value to those landowners. Some might even say it's sacred to them. They inherited it from their family and they might want to pass it on to their family. Um, some natural resource professionals get it backwards here. They think it's a privilege for the landowner to have you come out on their land. It's the other way around. Uh, landowners are going to be able to sense if you appreciate the opportunity they're giving you by opening their doors and opening their gates to you. Okay? You're going to see things that most people don't get to see, and go places most people don't get to go because of your positions and and your opportunities in working with private landowners, you need to be appreciative of that and recognize that it is your privilege to, to be able to go out there. Um, and they'll be able to, to know whether that's the way you feel or not. What's colostrum? The first milk that uh, Nat okay, you could say it has natural antibiotics that's necessary for the newborn lamb or calf. Lamb, I said lamb. And you'll be impressed. I have lamb slides in here. It's pretty cool. Um, so that's what colostrum is, in case you didn't know. Who do we really work for? Yes, you do owe allegiance to your employer. Obviously, they're writing your paychecks, your boss, and your organization. But in order to gain the trust and confidence of the landowner, it's important to have the mindset that you are working for them, and they will notice that too. Okay, so where's your mind at? Um, what style of roof is on that barn? It's called a gambrel roof. Listening. When we gain some expertise or perceived expertise in some area, our tendency is to talk too much and try to impress people with how much we know. Uh, we have a lot we want to say, and we think we can help the landowner if they just knew what we know, so we want to blurt it out. But uh, often we speak too much and prematurely. This is important to know how to convey your knowledge the most effective way. And it's usually not by talking too much, and listening is a skill that has to be learned, okay? What is LA-200? It's an antibiotic that's used to doctor livestock all the time, broad spectrum. If they get sick, you give them a shot of that. That's just kind of what happens. 
common. It's, it's their land, honor their objectives. Stan Reinecke tells the following story. He says, I was working with a landowner on the coastal prairie. We're discussing brush control on his land, and he stated that he wanted to restore the land back to its true, original prairie condition. I questioned this, since the ranch had a very viable hunting operation with deer, quail, and turkey. I knew the removal of brush would severely impact these hunting enterprises. When I asked him why he wanted to do this, his answer was, oh, I didn't know that. I guess I'll do what you say. No. He says, because I want it that way. Even though I thought the decision was wrong, it's his land, and he makes the decision, and he has to live with the consequences. Okay? Don't be too judgmental about landowner objectives. I think it's a message here. What are waddles and dewlaps? Who's doing this? What do you mean this? What is <laughs> Somebody answer. What's a waddle and a dewlap? It's a method of branding. It's a method of marking cattle, especially, right? So they cut a piece of skin under their neck. A waddle is hanging under the uh, throat latch. A dewlap is hanging down further close to the brisket. Why do they want to do that? Why would you use that method to mark livestock? What? Quick ID and from a distance. If you're if you're looking at cattle on the side of the hill through your binoculars, you can't see their brand. Learn to read people. Kent Mills states, most important element for working with landowners is to listen to them and be able to determine their goals, motivations, abilities, potentials, desires, dedications, and their financial capability. All from listening. Wow. You have to have magical powers of discernment to do that. This is our challenge. They will usually not come right out and tell you those things directly. You will probably not want to come right out and ask them directly. But this is what you have to get down to. Your success with working with them will depend on your ability to discern these things. It's a hard thing to do. What is that stick and chain for? It's to open the gate and close the gate. Don't tell people what they should do. Private landowners do not usually appreciate being told what they should do, especially by an outsider government agent. Our job as their advisor is not to tell them what to do, but clearly present to them all the information necessary to make good decisions. And H.B. Passy puts it this way. He says, the sign of a good conservationist is to lead the landowners to think that they thought up the idea in the first place. You give them the information that leads them to the right decision, right? Because What's more likely to happen? The idea that they thought of, that you said, yeah, that's a good idea, you should do that. Or the idea where you said, you know what you should do, is this. What's more likely to happen? The one that they thought of, right? What is the advantage of open-faced sheep? Nope. <laughs> that is not the advantage. Oh, this is a good one. Who knows the advantage of open-faced sheep on rangeland? They don't go wool blind. That's right. Especially in the winter, if they have to hustle through some snow to get their feed, and you get big clumps of, on their wool, they go wool blind. So 
So open faced sheep don't have that problem. Humility. Landowners usually do not appreciate arrogant people who think they know everything, obviously. Everyone has an ego, but the humble person has learned to suppress his or her ego. What is a free martin? It's a heifer twin, and what is special about them? She's sterile always. Yep. How are we doing on the quiz? The, the lower score you get, the more you need to take working effectively with livestock producers. <laughs> Integrity and trustworthiness. You will often live in the same small community as some of the landowners and your behavior and values away from work will become known in the community. Integrity and trustworthiness involves who you are 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Your actions outside the job will affect how able you are to work with people in your community while you are working in your job. Does a horse get up with the front first or the hind first? Horses get up front side first. How about cattle? Cattle front first or hind first? Cattle get up hind first. All right. That is not important. <laughs> At all. Oh, yeah, if they're trying to do it backwards. That's true. Don't you get it? This whole quiz is not important to your job at all. It's important just to know livestock, culture, and, and uh, uh, business so that uh, you can work effectively with landowners. Work ethic. In working with landowners, you must have the willingness to work long days when necessary often 12 to 14 hours and some long weeks. If you're in the 40 hour rut, your effectiveness is gonna be reduced. You know, if you wanna clock out on time every day, you know how landowners work. Um, sometimes you have to flex to their schedule. Okay, and that's gonna pay off. They're gonna be able to tell that you're committed to helping them when, when you do things like that. What's the proper name for that coil up rope? No, it's a lariat. <laughs> respect and empathy. Even if you disagree with them about some things, showing respect will be noticed, and it will help you gain their respect. Learn to empathize with landowners by putting yourself in their boots. Think about it that way sometimes. Russell Stevens said they need to know that you care about them and can understand their needs. Showing them you care is paramount to building their trust. Another way to say this is, I can't remember where I heard this, uh, people do not care how much you know until they what? Until they know how much you care. Okay, remember that. They don't care how smart you are or how much you know until they know how much you care. So you have to be genuine. Oh, there it is. What's that dog's job? Protect the sheep. Protect the sheep from predators, right? That's what, what are yours do, Patty? <laughs> so how am I doing with the sheep pictures, Patty? All right. Handling disagreement. Renowned range ecologist, Dykster House offers these words of wisdom. The professional conservationist must often make an independent and even unpopular stand. The non-professional is content with promotion of that which is currently acceptable or popular. In all cases, be gracious, professional, 
and always be willing to reevaluate your position. Okay? Always be willing to go back and say, maybe I don't know the right answer on this. Let's reconsider together. What color is that horse? No, nope. it's a bay. Why is it a bay? Has a black mane and tail. Do not improvise and be honest. Do not improvise or wing it when you're unsure of the best response to a difficult question. And don't speak beyond your level of knowledge. Landowners can tell if you're a phony and it's going to harm your credibility. What is a good response? I don't know, but I'll find out. And, you know, the majority of the battle of doing our work is knowing where to look to get the answers. Right? You don't have to carry it all around in your head. You have to know where to look. What kind of weird barbecue is that? Yep, those are... Those are branding irons. That keeps the branding irons hot. One cardinal rule in working with landowners. Never ask a question to which they might give the wrong answer. This is H.B. Passies in The Art of Communication. If they give you the wrong answer, what do you have to do? You have to tell them they're wrong. That's not good communication. That is not a good strategy. So. You know, asking questions is a good idea to do, but be careful that you don't ask a question which they might give the wrong answer and find yourself in this position very often. Describe that lamb. What did you say? <laughs> Probably, but I was looking for something else. Calico? No. <laughs> Wow, this might be a local thing. Uh, <coughs> where I'm from, we call these a smut face. What is it, Patty? Well, it is a cross between a Suffolk and a white face, but it's a smut face lamb. Okay, <laughs> this is important. Man, this is hard. Man, this is hard for me. Don't use jargon. Avoid using your technical jargon. We have a lot of words, acronyms, and stuff that only range people know. Have you, have you seen some stuff here on the quiz that you didn't know? OK, landowners feel the same way when you talk your range stuff sometimes. Be cognizant of that. Um, at least define the term before you use it with the landowner. Acronyms should be avoided. Scientific plant names do not impress. Reference state and similarity index are not widely understood terms. Save your technical vocabulary for your communication with your colleagues. Okay, you kind of got to switch codes when you're talking to a landowner. The main point is that you must ensure the person you're working with understands what you're saying. Any terms you use which are new to them, must be defined in terms that they understand. What's that post called? That's a snubbin post. What's it used for? <laughs> yeah? OK, we'll leave it at that. Learn from mistakes. Just remember the old adage, a person who makes no mistakes is a person who is not doing anything. You will make mistakes if you are actively involved with landowners. It's going to happen. Everybody does. The right response to mistakes is to acknowledge them and figure out how to avoid repeating them. Okay. What are those green Cheerios for? Castration and docking tails. Continual self-improvement. Never get to the point where you think you have all the right answers. This is arrogant and foolhardy. Nature and natural resources are far too complex for anyone to think they've figured it all out. Dan Cottle offers these words of truth regarding complacency. 
Anyone who's completely satisfied with himself has either an enormous ego or a short memory or low standards. Okay? And so this, to me, this is why we should keep involved with SRM, why we should be certified uh, range management specialists, and, and why we should keep going to the continuing education that that whole program offers. Um, What are the hooks and the pins? Right, a body condition score, BCS score. This is where you look on the cow and it's the hip bones, right? Parts of the hip bone. The hooks and the pins. Confidence and assertiveness. After you have earned the trust of landowners and gained some confidence and credibility, there may be occasions when you have to be a little more forceful in expressing your message. Work up to it. According to Russell Stevens, there are times and places we need to be assertive in order to protect a resource or ensure the landowner is able to continue operating. At what point might you want to start doing this if necessary? This would be after the relationship of trust has been earned. Okay. Um, what color is this horse? It's a paint. Character matters. It is not good enough to have excellent ecological and natural resource skills. Effective work with landowners requires many character qualities in addition to technical ability. What did the rider do with this rope? That's a dally around the horn. Go out of your way. Landowners will take note of the extra effort you put forth, and this will build trust and confidence. The excellent advice of Bill Eichenhorst is straightforward. Undersell and over-deliver always. I think sometimes we oversell our programs, don't you? Undersell and overdeliver. This enclosure has no water source and only one gate. What's it for? It's a round pen for horse training. Landowner involvement. Involve the landowners as much as possible in what you're doing. If you're going to clip a plot with them, let them select the spot. Have them help with the clipping. Hand them the scales to do the weighing. Put it in their hands as often as you can. You might need to demonstrate how to read the scales, but it's always better than just doing it for them. What does AI stand for? Artificial insemination. Give a genuine compliment. Oh, cool, another sheep one. <laughs> Brag on them when you notice something that is noteworthy. Landowners like to know you've noticed the good things they're doing. That'll go a long way. Go out of your way and try to find something to give a genuine compliment to the landowner about their place. Like it, you could say, wow, that's a really nice sheep camp. Right, well, this, that's right, this is the sheep camp. What's this? You guys. Go ahead, Patty. It's commissary. It's the commissary. <laughs> All right, sorry. It's another Utah thing. <laughs> Do not wait too long to develop the report, or what, what do we call it in our case, conservation plan. Uh, do it while everything's fresh on your mind. Take time to write thoughtful, thorough, practical, and informative reports after each visit. The uh, value of those things is greater than you think. If, you know, the landowner might not have a map of his property. Yet. And you might have just given him the first actual map of his whole property that he has. 
besides the county record. That can be an important and meaningful thing. Um, Tom Simper, my mentor, says that handwritten notes on a map or a spec sheet show the landowner that it's just for him and not just a boilerplate brochure. Okay, we avoid making handwritten notes like, oh, I gotta get this back to the office and type it and then I'll print it and give it to you. It might actually be better if you handwritten it on the thing and, and gave it to them. More meaningful than that. How many feet in a rod? 16 and a half. Good. And what, what ranch commodity that we deal with actually all the time is usually sold by the rod? Wire, fence wire. Always thank them. Always be gracious. At the end of the day, always thank the landowner for the privilege of spending time with them on their property. Likewise, always be gracious, not just to those who are kind and considerate, but also the old belligerent hardhead. Always be gracious. What type of trailer hitch system is this called? It's a gooseneck. No. Professional etiquette. Always be on time and be well prepared. Promptly return phone calls and messages. Don't check them. While you're out there, don't look at your phone like I just did. I'm sorry. And I was checking the time. <laughs> Doing so is a sign of disrespect. Be careful how you dress, how you speak, and your mannerisms. You're trying to fit into their culture and not stick out like a sore thumb. Dress should be similar to the norm for landowners of the region and should generally be conservative and not drawing attention to yourself. Do not invite yourself hunting fishing, or even drop hints of such. If you do a good job, you'll get plenty of invites. Don't hunt arrowheads. Ask permission before you take pictures on their land. Okay. These are good habits. Where is that style of hat common? It's a Nevada hat. Become well-rounded in natural resources. You can't be an expert on everything, but you need to have a basic working knowledge of the natural resource and ag issues of your area. Okay. What's that tool? That's a Ralgro gun. What do you do with it? You implant those little pellets in their ear because they have hormones. So if Talk about hormone-free beef. This is what not to do. <laughs> this is how they do it. Learn to read the land. Roy Burroughs notes the ability of reading the land will tell you a lot about past management and history of the property. I love doing this. I can always tell, you know, not always, but it's fun to try. If you look at the plant community in a pasture, and, you, and before you ask the landowner how that gets grazed, you, if you pay attention, you can usually get it right, how they graze that before they tell you. Okay. Dan Caudill says, don't just observe, but learn to evaluate, investigate, analyze, and ask why. Natural curiosity and the desire to understand how the land works is an important element for success, successful natural resource professionals. What is that piece of equipment? It's a cake feeder or a cube feeder. <laughs> yeah, that's like a brand new one. <laughs> Learn plants. Oh man, this is my weakness, honestly. According to Rory Burroughs, sharing your knowledge of plants is always a great icebreaker experience with landowners. Plant knowledge begins by learning to identify and name plants, and it deepens as a person learns the ecological value, the function of the plant, its response to grazing, um, its success in seedings, where it tends to grow. Uh, no single skill is more important 
and a working knowledge of the plant in your area. What is the collective term for saddles, bridles, accoutrements, and such? Tack. That is all tack, and that is a tack room. Tools of the trade. A common mistake for land management advisors is to promote only a few favorite practices. In some cases, overemphasize only one tool, like you're the prescribed burning guy or you're the brush control guy, and you ignore other essential practices. Another mistake to avoid is bad mounting of certain tools you may have a personal bias against. You hate high fences, you hate summer burning, you hate whatever. Avoid that. All tools have their proper place and should be considered when the, they fit the need. Okay. What is that trailer for? It's a hay trailer. It's for round bales. Because that's tipped up right now and the round bales rolled off. Appreciate economic reality. Some landowners have outside income they're willing to invest in the land without a direct economic return. Others are bona fide ag producers that are on a tight budget and have to consider every step they make. How is that going to affect their financial situation? So economic constraints often trump even the best intended conservation. Uh, plan. Just be cognizant of those realities. Um, I guess, in part, that's a lot of what our programs are intended to alleviate. What should you do if you come across this while working on a landowner's place? A coyote in a trap. What should you do? Oh, why heck? That's against the law in Utah. You don't touch it. You go ahead and tell them what you saw, but it is against the law to mess with that. No simple solutions. For every complex problem, there is a solution that is simple, neat, and wrong. <laughs> That's a great quote. If a landowner is willing to take the risk and try new unproven techniques, a small-scale test can be a good opportunity to determine whether the new practice merits further consideration. Why we always, this, even if you as the conservationist want to try something new or suggest something new, here's the key part of this is the small-scale test. Everybody knows about state and transition models and you don't like the box you're in, but you want to be in this box over here, but there ain't an arrow pointing to it. Oh, man. Does that mean you shouldn't do it ever? Because that's what it says. It's okay to try stuff, but it's a small-scale test. You've got to know that you're doing an experiment instead of doing a management action. And that's okay to do. What is this tool used for? That's a clincher, which you use when you're doing what? Shoeing horses. Flexibility, innovation, and creativity. They're often not in a position to make final, absolute decisions and stick to it no matter what. Realize this, that all the changes in weather, markets, family situation, economy, their goals, are going to alter plans. We have to be flexible and creative, just like the landowners do in our work with them, because there are unforeseen changes. Why is that cactus being torched? Burn the spines off it so the cattle can eat it. Cultivate your gifts. All of us have gifts and strengths and talents. Cultivate them. Whatever your interests are, focus on them to develop special abilities and expertise. Man, this is a hard job. Learn a little bit about everything, but still be an expert. It's true. Pass along your expertise to others. This is important. Both landowners and fellow professionals with humility, 
generosity and enthusiasm. Learn to communicate your passion and ability in these areas of special interest. Sharing that is important. What is that tool for? That's a fence wire stretcher. Become an expert, but do not get tunnel vision. Oh, we just talked about this. You need to develop a broad range of knowledge, but be careful not to get too far with the tunnel vision. The downside of having some expertise in some areas is a danger of getting tunnel vision and thinking of only your specialty and ignoring other important aspects. Maybe this is OK in your job. You know, consider what your job is. Maybe you need to have a little bit broader in your job. Kind of self-assess that. Uh, what kind of construction was used to build that shed? That's a pole barn, pole frame construction. Don't try to be a soloist and work with others. I heard a quote about this this morning. Did anybody else hear that? I wrote it down. Jenny Pluhar said it. Right? Yeah. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Right? That's this idea. Um, ask for help when you need it. Uh, involve others. Be a team player. Uh, these are important really skills to have. Don't get territorial. What is that thing? That is a snare. What's it for? Catching coyotes. Seek mentors. Your mentors should include a combination of successful landowners as well as experienced natural resource professionals. According to Jimmy Rutledge, a few key individuals will make a huge difference in your career and your effectiveness. I've never thought of that before. That your mentor should include successful landowners. But that is a heck of a good idea. What's in those bags? Wool. Those are wool bags. Pursue critical thinking skills. Too often, we see what we want to see, or see what we've been programmed to see. We jump to conclusions. We have these huge biases Critical thinking can help us separate good science from bad science. What? All science is good, yes? Uh, maybe not. There is bad science and can help you develop sound interpretations, conclusions, and applications of scientific studies. What is that tool for? That tool is for dehorning. Speaking and writing. Although most of us would rather spend time individually with landowners, our efforts can be greatly multiplied if we share. Through speaking and writing, you'll be able to reach people that you would otherwise never meet. Uh, photography will greatly enhance your ability to communicate. Take your camera with you and use it often. What are those short style shaps called? Chinks. Oh, wow, everybody knows that. Become a great teacher. Science-based knowledge of nature, agricultural, and natural resource management is what we deliver to landowners. The way in which we deliver the information is crucial, and it requires that we learn the skill of becoming a great teacher. It's a huge aspect of our jobs when we work with landowners. Dalton, and to think of yourself as a teacher. Think of yourself that way. Dalton Mers is land that landowners learn best from other landowners. It's always best to see it on the land and have landowners tell their success or failure stories. So with that knowledge, what does a great teacher do? Listens, but I think he gets those landowners together somehow. How can I make that happen? Maybe you're not the one that needs to convey the message. Maybe you need to get the right people together. What is that thing? That's a creep feeder. Yeah. Because how does it work? Nope. What's that? Is that the feeder? How come they're fencing it out? Keep the cows out so what gets in? 
baby cat. Oh, finally, the last slide. If you want to be successful, it's just this simple. Know what you're doing, love what you're doing, and believe in what you're doing. That's a Will Rogers quote. What is that piece of tack called that goes under the tail? That is a crouper. Every horse's ass knows that. <laughs> All right. So the contributors to this uh, PowerPoint, and well, these are all the contributors to Steve Nelly's publication that I've emailed to all of you. And uh, please take the time to read it. It's not terribly long. It uh, contains all this wisdom and more uh, that I've, I've tried to convey to you here. And it has all these people as contributors to that publication. It's extremely valuable. So with that, I'm right on time. I have three minutes for stories.